Hello, my name is Irv Lustig from Princeton Consultants, and it's my honor and pleasure today to interview Thomas Cook, the former president of Sabre Decision Technologies and a key figure in the development and implementation of operations research solutions in industry. So Tom, thanks for the spending the time with me today, and we look uh, forward to hearing about your long career and contributions to uh, operations research. Sure. So let's start off with the early parts. Uh, where and when were you born? In Chicago. In Chicago? Yeah. And did you grow up there through high school? Yeah, I was in high school in the suburbs of Chicago. And, uh, and when I went to college, I never went back to the suburbs. And uh, tell us about your family and, and siblings. Did you have any? Uh... I had a brother uh, who died of polio when I was eight. Oh, wow. Uh, and two parents and good parents. And uh, did your parents have any like math backgrounds or things like that no, that suggested my, you go this direction? No, my dad was a white collar work in a purchasing department and my mother was a assistant librarian. Um, and so you went to school in a local public or sure. private schools? Public, school. public schools all the way through high school? Sure. And when you were in high school at that age, what kind of subjects were you interested in? I wasn't really interested in too many subjects, <laughs> to be quite honest. But I, uh, one good thing was the math was easy, so I didn't have to work very hard. And so I, I spent a lot of time working when I was in high, in high school, uh, delicatessen. Oh, okay. And so make, making sandwiches and, and the like? Oh, everything, yeah. Okay. From stocking the shelf. Actually, a couple of summers, I actually ran the place oh. while the owner was on vacation. Uh, maybe that was a, a uh, predictor of the, the future of running things. Well, really, uh, he taught me, uh, the pr proprietor taught me a lot about how businesses should work and profit motives and margins and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's really great. Um, so you mentioned that math was kind of easy to you. So were there things that you saw then in, in math in high school that kind of led to your eventual interest in OR? Or it no. Just, it was just easy. OR came to me when I was uh, getting an MBA. And um, so you went to undergraduate where? At Grinnell College in Iowa uh, with a math major. And what made you choose Grinnell? It was small, and my parents thought I should go to a small school for some reason. Uh, it was private, and it was a very high-quality school, if, if you know anything about small liberal arts schools. And so it wasn't, you had to select a major. You couldn't go into engineering or, or things like that. But uh, so I selected math. So Tom, after you spent a year in law school, what did you do next? Well, I got a job. I got a job at an aerospace company in their engineering department. And I was there for about five years. And about two years after I got there, I transferred to the IT department to design information systems for the engineering department because I understood the engineering department and that was useful for the IT group. And did you have a, a background in any information systems from when you were in college no. or you, that you were just learning it on the fly? I was learning it then. And, uh, and then uh, about two years into my, about a year into my uh, stay at LTV, the aerospace company, I started an MBA program at SMU at night. And it was a long program for me because I hadn't had any prerequisites. So it was a 60 hour at night program. Okay. So it took a number of years. And then as, um, did you see any OR while you were in your MBA program? That's where I discovered OR. Oh, okay. And I fell in love with OR, really. Because I had this math degree and the aptitude and uh, I didn't see anywhere I could use it. So when I, when I had the intro to OR course, in the MBA program, I said, voila. Uh, and so from then on, I, well, I was so in love with the idea that I took a leave of absence from LTV and went to UT Austin to pursue a PhD in OR. And at UTA, um, was there a specific department you were in? Uh, yeah, I w well, I was uh, a research assistant and a teaching assistant in the uh, business school. But my outside field was mechanical engineering, where they taught a lot of OR. And uh, I had a computer science professor on my committee as well. So it was truly interdisciplinary. And 
how many years were you uh, in the PhD program? Three. Three years. And who was your advisor? My advisor was Bill Hunt. And what was your thesis on? It was on uh, scheduling a multi-programmed computer. Oh, so it was taking some of what you were doing in your job. Well, the I had access tech. to the data that I needed. I see. In order to prove which heuristics or which algorithm would work the best. I see. And um, so after getting your PhD, what came next? Um, what came next was looking for a job. <laughs> and I, I was looking in academia. So I actually uh, had several opportunities, but one the opportunity I chose was the University of Tulsa uh, to be in their uh, OR and operations management program. And this is in what year? This is in, um, hmm, that's a good question. This is in uh, the six, no, no, probably 67. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I was at uh, UT uh, for about five years, maybe five and a half, I don't know. Uh, but while I was there, I was spending time mostly teaching, uh, doing some research, uh, but doing a lot of consulting. I wrote a couple of textbooks with Bob Russell that were pretty successful. Uh, and then I got tired of academia. So let's talk a little bit about the textbooks. Uh, the textbooks were in what in, area? Intro to Operations Research. And uh, one of them is called Contemporary Operations Management. So they're fairly close, closely linked. Now, you mentioned also that while, I mean, I guess you were an assistant professor at Tulsa, you were doing consulting on the side. Yes. And this is, I guess, now early, late 60s, early 70s time frame. Late, late 60s. Late 60s. Um, how are you able to get contacts into industry to do the consulting? Just through the university and uh, just, just, uh, Knowing the right people, yeah. And and were there some interesting projects you worked on back then? Oh yeah, uh, scheduling uh, one 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 we actually uh, published in Management Science, which was uh, scheduling salt trucks for an ice storm. Okay. A branch is a branch rooting problem, and they it was it was quite uh, effective. And this is something that they used in like the city of Tulsa. Yes. Oh, that's, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, those kinds of projects. Uh, but that was, that was uh, an issue because we rode around with the salt trucks and, and figured out how, what their real problems were. Did you, uh, did you have, were you able to supervise any PhD students? No, we didn't have any PhD students at Tulsa. Oh, really? Okay. Right. Okay. So, it was, uh, so basically the research was your own research, no oh, grad yeah. students to help out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so you mentioned then after five and a half, six years or so, you said, okay, done with academia. So what came next? Well, I got, I gotten within six hours of getting my MBA. And so I always felt once I got the MBA, I would do something else. Well, I decided early on in my MBA program, that what I really wanted to do was get a PhD in OR. So, so when I got close enough, I took this leave of absence from the aerospace company and went to Austin, Texas, and joined their uh, the program. Oh, so you were then t teaching in teaching at Austin after well, Tulsa? Well, I did. Yeah, I was teaching as most of our PhD students were teaching okay. something. Yeah, so I was a TA. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so I was teaching statistics, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I taught at, at uh, UT Austin. Okay, right. But so I'm trying to get the sequence right. But after mm -hmm. UT Austin, you got your PhD, then you went to Tulsa. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Right. Well, I think there were some other places that I saw that you had taught at besides Tulsa. Well, BU, uh, Boston University. Uh, but, but I taught in their uh, overseas program. Have you, do you know about that? No. Okay. Uh, they have an overseas program. They have a, they, I still think they have it. It was a contract with DOD to provide graduate education to people that were in Germany and Italy. Mm -hmm. And so I actually taught computer science, statistics, and operations management 
uh, for this program in uh, Western Germany, in Niederall, in Baumoller, in Berlin, in Naples, and in Heidelberg. So four trimesters. Okay. Well, I was there. So it was like a, oh, well, a year or two then. Yeah, oh, I, took a, I took a uh, leave of absence from Tulsa. Okay. And did that. And um, it was a very good experience. Didn't get much research done. Right. But it was a very, a very good uh, educational experience. And I took my family uh, there. So we took a baby that was six weeks old and so forth and so on. It was interesting. So, but then that was that dur- kind of during your time yeah. when you had your appointment at Tulsa. Yeah. So you meant, so then you decided to leave Tulsa and you went in, into industry. Uh, yes. And what, so what was the first industry job, I guess, doing OR? Parker Young and Company okay. in the consulting practice. And uh, they, what they hired me to do in Tulsa uh, was to start an OR practice. So I did that for like two and a half, three years. Uh, and then it's funny, I, I was expecting to be made partner and they said, it's going to be delayed a year. I said, no, I don't like that. So I was looking for another job. And that's when the American Airlines uh, opportunity came up. So before we get to the American yeah. Airlines story, which I know is a yeah. very important part of your yeah. career, um, it, when you were at Arthur Young, then were the clients they were working with in, across various industries? Oh, yeah. Uh, like one client uh, was my client was uh, North American Van Lines, where we did a huge project, which uh, helped them manage their fleet of tractor trailers in a better way. Uh, they needed to figure out when to maintain them, when to buy them, when to sell them, okay. and so forth and so on. Okay. And those, that was a big uh, LP uh, that we actually did for them. Okay. And so this is probably like mid 70s or so? This is uh, probably, yeah, yeah. I mean, so what what kind of tools did you have available then to do like solving an LP for North American Airlines? Yeah, just uh, what uh, it might have been your your tool. <laughs> I think we didn't exist back then. But. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but there were tools out there. Right. Uh, if we could formulate the problem, we could uh, we could solve. Okay, and um, so then then you moved on to American Airlines, yes. and uh, I think I remember reading that they kind of hired you in to start running the OR program. They hired me as a director of OR. Right. They had a 13-person group. And so what what kinds of things were happening before you got there? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me tell you, the group was uh, probably half programmers and half OR people. Mm-hmm. And what they were doing was uh, they were uh, a couple of projects. One was in uh, crew scheduling, or actually crew planning. And the other one was they were just starting to build a revenue management system. Uh, and they had, you know, one or two OR guys on each one of those projects, but they weren't really making a big impact on the corporation. And, and why do you think they were limited at the one? You- well, their size, number one. Uh, number two, I don't think they had the right culture. They were more, they were more enjoying the, the discovery rather than really focusing on what can I do to make this company more profitable or more successful. And so what types of techniques did you use to change that culture? I try to transform them from kind of a a think tank that spent a lot of time talking just to each other uh, into a consulting company within the company. And that's, that's what worked because we actually started marketing our services in a very aggressive way to the, the departments that we thought were really ripe for an OR approach to problem solving. And so as that, so I guess you started growing the team as well as growing the types of applications that you were going Absolutely. in. Absolutely. So what would you say were some of the first successes that occurred there? Well, um, one uh, one early project. Uh, I'm thinking about 
which projects made a big difference as far as our growth is concerned. Right. Sure. Uh, because we we're going to do the like rescheduling no matter what. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do revenue management no matter. Although that that had a big impact because I got we got a lot of senior management uh, visibility with some of these projects. But wasn't but wasn't revenue management at American Airlines was the first airline to bring those techniques Absolutely, in, yeah. right? So. I mean, I find it interesting you said we we're going to do it no matter what, but in some sense, you were also groundbreaking in doing it. Yes, that's true. But, but it had already gotten started when I got there. Okay. And so there were people who were working on the model, the demand forecasting models and so forth. Uh, and so all we had to do is convince, uh, continue to convince senior managers to make that investment in building that, that system. But it was also building something, a different way of, Amer the airline doing business, oh yeah, as opposed to saying, "Hey, we can." So you know, the idea of of segmenting out the different price levels, et cetera, and what have you. So, how are you able to convince the management to say, "Hey, we should be selling our tickets differently than we have in the past"? Well, we we had a number of presentations that kind of, as the technology evolved, and we 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 uh, proved. Uh, through prototypes and other ways, uh, what the value was. They were more than anxious for us to continue. In fact, the reason that group grew very, very fast is because we had senior management's uh, ear and uh, the CEO of American, Bob Crandall, uh, uh, became very enamored with OR and what we could do for the corporation. And we did it in a number of ways. We, we had, uh, different kinds of projects. One, one kind of project was a consulting project, which there was a one-time decision to be made, and we could have an impact on that decision. For example, a good example of that was, uh, I don't know what the year was, but one year, uh, the airport authority in, in DFW came to us and said, we want you to build uh, a new terminal on the west side of DFW. And we we need a decision on this in a month from you. So you need to go to your board and it's a multi-billion dollar decision. And so I was I happened to be in the staff meeting where this was being discussed. And I said, well I think we can help. And Bob Crandall basically said, well how can you help, Tom? I said, well we can simulate the airspace in the ground side of the airport and tell you, we'll give you a feel for the operational capability uh, that you would have to have. And he said, well, I need it in a month. And I said, well, we can't give it to you in a month. We can do that in maybe six months because we, had, we knew there was an FAA simulation model uh, that existed that we might be able to use. I said, if we can get that, modify it and validate it, then we can run it with different scenarios and tell you what we think the operational feasibility is of this new terminal. So that, that was one kind of project. It turned out that uh, the simulation uh, actually demonstrated that they would have gridlock on the ground and gridlock in the air if they built the terminal the way they were talking about doing it. So what did they end up doing? They ended up redesigning the airspace mainly redesigned the airspace and eventually built the terminal. But after we to told them what new runways they would need and so what the taxiways should be like and how many gates they could have and so forth. I see, okay. So that's that's one kind of project. That's a one-time project. Uh, then there are a lot of projects that were building systems, uh, like the revenue management system is a big one, um, but other systems as well crew planning systems, scheduling systems, how you schedule it, when, what, you, where you should you fly, what should you fly, and when should you fly. Okay. Uh, and those, those are very, very important decisions to an airline. And at the time, no airlines were using OR to do that. So do you feel that some of the work that you were doing at that time, the other airlines started taking notice and then building up their own OR groups? Yeah, well, you know, uh, OR has a big, uh, big footprint in, relatively speaking, in airlines. Uh, 
there's the airline group uh, like of Agri Agri Force, Force, right? which I was president of for a while. Uh, that, that group uh, is composed of just airlines and, and they get together and, and share secrets. And that was always a problem. What should you share and what should you not share? But um, yeah, I, I think they, they learned a lot from us and we learned a lot from them. So, uh, so that, was, uh, that was that. But the, the key is that we just kept growing the group. In fact, one time, uh, the chairman and CEO came to me and said, Tom, I want you to, I want you to really grow your group. Give me, give me a, a plan. This is when they were pretty strapped. Other, other departments were having to cut back. And so I gave them a plan that was like twice as big as the group was at the time. And, uh, and the funny thing about it is he, he loved it. Uh, but all his senior officers were not too happy with me because they were constricting. And here he was telling me to, to grow double the size of my group and my budget. Uh, so, but, but that's the way it was and it worked out, it worked out fine. The only problem I had was I told him, this is anecdotal, but uh, I told him, you know, I can't really grow this group that much uh, with the existing green card uh, policies of HR. And so he said, what do you mean? I said, well, we don't sponsor people. And a lot of the people that we'd like to hire are not U.S. citizens. And he said, well, we'll fix that. And so he fixed it. Uh, so, that, so we we had a very diverse group of, of very very bright people. So I know at some point, you know, your role, your responsibility went from like a director of OR at American, and I think then you grew into a, a got subsidiary. To, to, well, it was before we, the subsidiary was uh, the subsidiary was I think it was American Airlines, and so you were just doing American Airlines work. Yes. Um. So exclusively. Yeah. So what made it? the subsidiary different than just being a department within the airline? Oh, well, it was a big difference, huge difference. Um, what happened is I decided that uh, we had grown as the right size for American Airlines. Do you remember and, about how many people that was at that time? Uh, it's probably under 100, but not too much under 100. Okay. Um, anyway, so I put together a business plan and basically presented it to the senior management and got the approval to actually uh, create the subsidiary uh, called American Airlines Decision Technologies. My only, uh, again, Bob Crandall says, I only have two constraints on you, Tom. One is don't do any work for our competitors. And the second one is make a profit in the first year. So it wasn't like they're just gonna fund us to go see if this would work. So, uh, so I was very excited about that because I'm kind of entrepreneurial anyway. And it allowed me to grow the group and grow, uh, grow the jobs within the group. Meaning I had a lot of very talented people, but they, uh, I think they needed something more. And so, so we started at ADT. Our first client was Amtrak which is okay. not a competitor. Right. And our first airline client was Qantas Airlines. And hey, they were so far away, that didn't matter I either. I see. Okay. All right. So, so, so that's what happened. And so that was in 87. So, so were the clients that AADT mm -hmm. was working on only, only in transportation or they, you did work outside of transportation as well? Uh, outside of transportation as well. Uh, we ended up uh, doing work for almost every airline in the world. Uh, not every airline, but, uh, but even even ones that were located in the U.S. Eventually, eventually, okay. eventually. Um, but anyway, so so yeah, other clients uh, we did work for was bizarre clients like Israeli Air Force, okay, uh, like the U.S. Navy, uh, like. Uh, uh, tr other travel uh, companies like Hertz or a uh, rider truck. Okay. 
uh, cruise, all the cruise lines, not all the cruise lines, but a number of cruise lines. Uh, those are mostly revenue management uh, engagements. And so, and, and the arrangement, even though it was a subsidiary, which was allowing you to do a war work we had our outside own of the airline. Yeah, we had our own P&L. Right. We had our own compensation plan, uh, which was very important to us. And then you had, a, I guess you had an arrangement with American Airlines to say, hey, we're billing you for our services. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. That, we build them like we build outside clients. Okay. And that allowed us to say to American clients that um, you can have as much as the OR as you can afford, uh, as opposed to, well, we're constricted by a budget. Right. If we were constricted by a budget, then we could say, I had to say no to some airline, American Airlines clients before ADT got, got built or started mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't have the resources to do everything everybody wanted. So we had to actually prioritize projects that we would take on at American Airlines. Okay. Before ADT. Before After ADT, we were much more available, if you will. Right. So then I guess when... The one of the transitions I imagine that occurred mm -hmm. was when you were within the airline, and you were selling and marketing your services sort of internally. But yes. now, as AADT, you probably had to build a sales team to oh, go yeah. out and sell to yeah, all this these is different a real industries, sales team. right? Because because not only were we selling our services, but we were selling software, right? Okay. See, we were we were productizing the things that we we were building, uh, and so we would build something even for an airline, uh, not American, but a different airline. And if we built it and, and it really had value, which it usually did, then we would, we would, uh, we would try to transform it into a product. Okay. And that's what the sales force is basically selling was product, not service. So you mentioned that you ended up doing work for many of the airlines. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, as opposed to them, I think today, I mean, I know there's some companies out there that do services sure. in some of the airlines, but they also, the airlines have built up each one of their own OR departments. Oh, yeah, they all right. have OR departments. In fact, the guy that hired us on that first engagement with Qantas, he was the head of their OR internal consulting department. Oh, I see. And he, we knew each other from Agafors. And he said, I think you've got something that we don't have and we need. And so we, we did that project for them. Eventually, they, he came to me one time when, after I had transferred to Sabre and said, I think I've got something you guys need. And he had created something called Quick Red, which was uh, an industrial engineering approach to uh, res agents' workstation because at the time, all the reservation systems were green screen and very, very difficult. And he came up with, with a, a software product that makes it look more like what you see today, uh, colors and graphs right. and so forth and so on, and made it very user friendly and, and got rid of a lot of keystrokes uh, just by putting uh, software in between the TPF reservation system and uh, and the user. Uh, so we actually bought that from Qantas and marketed it to the world. So you mentioned in passing there about that uh, eventually, I guess, American Airlines Decision Technologies became Sabre or? What happened there, that's an interesting story, but what happened there is Sabre, Sabre was the old legacy. Reservation uh, system, right? Green screens and all. Yes. That was, that was the software, but they also did all the, all the other IT data processing type things for American. And okay. were they, were they solely doing American work when yeah. they were Sabre? Okay. Well, they had a, they had a subsidiary called Amaris, AMR Information Service. And Amaris, uh, was doing some of the same things we were doing, not OR, no OR. They had no capability there, but they were, selling their reservation system to other companies like SNCF, 
okay. Fresh Railroad. Okay. That was a that was a contract that Amherst had, and uh, then they came to us, SNCF and Amherst came to us. Can you build us a reservation, uh, a uh, revenue management? So we built the revenue management system for the French Railroad for the S, uh, for the uh, TGV. Okay. And uh, it's funny when we when we delivered it, we were having a big celebration at a Chateau outside of Paris, and uh, the chairman of, uh, of uh, SNCF uh, was was giving a speech, and he says, "Now we come." There were like a hundred uh, reservation. Uh, software developers on the project, and then there was like eight of us. Uh, and he said, "Now we come to give the plaques out to the people that made this all possible, because that's the only way we could pay for this new reservation." Okay. And he gave it to the OR guy. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, no. So we were talking about then the what Saber right exi- was existing at the same time as AADT was right, and if I oh were- yeah yeah Saber. Saber did all the IT processing for AMR. Right. Plus, they had this other subsidiary called Amaris, which was selling basically the reservation system. And they were selling it, if I recall. The multi host. And they were also selling it to other airlines as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right? Because like, if I remember. Southwest. Right. So, I, I mean, if I remember, and yeah. this is going back for me because I was pretty young then, is yeah. like Sabre was sort of the industry standard as a reservation system oh, absolutely. for all the airlines, absolutely. right? And for travel agents. And for travel agents, yeah. right. So now, so then there was a point in time when something happened to get either yeah. between AADT and Sabre and your movement in between. That about part that. I haven't. I'll tell you about understood. that. Okay. So, so AADT had grown for like, Probably five years. So we were probably six or 700 people, uh, mostly OR people, but we had some marketing people, some finance people, sales, right. and sales, and so forth and so on. Um, and some software, uh, you know, coders, software developers. Okay. But it was an OR company. I mean, every senior management position was, it was like DuPont and chemical engineers, right? Right. Uh, so, so then we started bumping into Sabre in the marketplace. Uh, they wanted to, they wanted to sell their software, their legacy software to other airlines. Okay. And I said, that's, I can't do that. Uh, and so I did another business plan and presented it and says, either you need to sell AADT which we were, I even had a, a buyer for them, uh, or you need to really merge at least the development resources of Sabre to AADT, and Amherst needs to be part of AADT. That's what he chose to do, uh, he meaning Bob Crandall. Mm-hmm. So we, there were 2,500 of them and like six or 700 of us at the time, and we merged those two companies together. And that became Sabre Decision Technologies. Exactly. Right. Now, and your position there was? President. President, which I guess, there was, that was that the highest ranking officer at the time? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, so now, so Sabre Decision Technologies now was selling the core reservation software, and you had all this OR work going on, right. especially in the revenue management system right. space. Those two need to talk to each other. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, and so how, uh, and was it still having the, the mission of trying to go out and also work in multiple industries and do OR consulting as well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and how long were you then the head of uh, Sabre? Uh, well, Sabre Decision Technologies, you see, that happened in, um, that probably happened in, uh, 92, two ish. Mm-hmm. Um, then I, 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 uh, was there for about, uh, we did that for about three years. And then, uh, then we decided to take the rest of Sabre, um, uh, not the rest because, Travel agency business stayed with Sabre, but we took all the 
all the other uh, assets of Sabre, meaning the the operations people, people running uh, the computer okay. uh, computer network and uh, all the help desks and all that kind of stuff, and bring that into something called Sabre uh, Technology Solutions. Okay. STS. Uh, and I was became president of that. Uh, and because one of the reasons we did that is because uh, in order for Sabre to do better in the in the financial markets, we had to show lots of growth, mm. right? So the way to show growth well, or way to grow was to outsource. Okay. To do some outsourcing. So we decided to put that together and uh, and then go after the outsourcing business. This was, so Sabre was a publicly traded company yeah. at the time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it did it in two phases. One was they did the first 20% and then, then the rest. But, but what we did with... Um, so the first outsourcing customer was an, was an extremely big one, which was U.S. Airways. Okay. So we outsourced all their IT. And uh, and uh, it was the biggest outsourcing contract that year of any of the outsourcing contracts. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that's how the group. And so the group kept growing bigger and bigger, and it got more and more, less and less OR, and more and more just a big bureaucracy, really. And and still, one of the major clients was American Airlines. The the major client. the major client. Yeah. Right. So then, um, at some point, you decided to leave Saber. Yes, I, I decided because, as I say, it wasn't entrepreneurial anymore. It was it was just very big, and I decided that, and I had a, I had a difference of opinion. There was there was a, a friend of mine, and I had worked for him before. He was the chief financial officer at Amar at one time. But then he was promoted to being the CEO of all of Sabre. That would include the travel agency business. Okay. And he had a different business model than I had in my mind. And so we decided, I decided to leave. Okay. And because it just wasn't the right thing for me. So we left in uh, in 99. Bob Crandall left the same year. Uh, And it worked out fine. And so, what did you do after that? About ten days after that, I was I was working for McKinsey and Company. Okay. And I uh, did that for a few years, like three years. Doing OR, leading OR consulting types. Yeah, of OR consulting, uh, yield management consulting. Uh, air. I was part of the transportation practice. Okay. So. So. Uh, the problem was it was like an 80 or 90 percent travel requirement. Oh, okay. I, I, and uh, I just got tired of doing that. And uh, McKinsey is an outstanding company. I mean, they do hire the best and the brightest. And they're, they're good at it. All right. So then after McKinsey, what happened? Why? Well, I, I kept thinking I was retiring. <laughs> uh, but... Then I was on a board of Caleb Technologies in Austin, Texas, and the CEO there, Gong Yu, uh, I don't really know Gong Yu, but he was a chair professor. Yeah, I know the name. Yeah. Uh, well, Gong Yu, uh, he was a chairman and CEO, and he came to me and said, Tom, would you, would you mind taking my job? <laughs> and so I said, well, what do you need? He said, well, we need to make the company more profitable. I mean, it's a good startup. We got a really good core core group. A lot of them were his ex PhD students, um, and uh, so I said, "Yeah, okay, I'll I'll do that for a little while." So the idea was to get the company kind of on track, and uh, the VCs wanted to sell. Uh, they had a big venture capital uh, uh, character to it. Uh, and so they want, they actually wanted to sell. Well, it wasn't sellable at the time. So we went in there and spent two or three years, me and a couple other McKinsey guys, 
and uh, got it ready to sell, and we actually sold it. Right, but now there was some, I think there was a good project that you, Caleb, oh. was doing. Yeah, we got an 81 for that. That's right. So I wanted to say a little uh, bit about that, what that project was about. That's a great project. Uh, I had nothing to do with the intellectual content <laughs> of the project, but but I was very supportive of it. Uh, they had built uh, a solution to uh, what had been an intractable problem up until that time, which was solving the crew problem in a major disrupt in a disruption. You can think of when something hits like a 9-11 or so, something like that, or even, even a major snowstorm or whatever, airplanes get out of place and crews get out of place. And uh, airplanes are a problem, but not as big a problem as the crews because the crews have all kinds of rules and uh, regulations that you, you know, duty, duty time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so when that happens, what airlines were doing was they, they have people that had been dealing with those things for like 20 years and they had their little heuristics and their light, rules of thumb that they would do, what they would cancel, what they would delay, right. and then what to, what do we, and once you figure that out, then you figured out what to do with the crews. And, uh, and that was a very difficult thing to do. Well, these guys in Austin did it. For Continental, uh, the crew part of it, not the mm -hmm. airplane part, and so and that was a tougher problem. So and I was on the board, so I was I was familiar with what they had done. I knew it was good. So so I went there, and we kind of transformed that little group uh, to uh, to be more client, a little bit more client oriented, but mainly. Uh, to get profitable. So in order to get profitable, we need a couple more products. We need to actually sell what they what they had done. And uh, I remember this one one time we were we were selling it to uh, Southwest. Oh yeah, Southwest. Uh, we were down in Dallas uh, with all the crew guy guys that do this crew scheduling thing. Right. Uh, well, they didn't want anything to do with us because we're really threatening their job. They enjoyed solving right. these puzzles, right. you know? And so, uh, so we made our pitch and, uh, and it was clear that we weren't making much progress. I mean, they were, they were, it was going to be, well, thanks for coming. And well, we'll let you know if we uh, want to go forward. But uh, one of the, one of my guys, uh, my main guy, uh, Nader Kabani actually asked uh, them, well, what's your toughest problem? And they said, shutting down Baltimore. And I said, okay, well, let's shut down Baltimore. How long do you want to shut it down? Four hours. Or maybe it's eight hours. I don't know what it's about. Anyway, so he got on a computer, <laughs> gave him a solution <laughs> in a few minutes uh, after he got the data in. And uh, and they took two or three days verifying that it was a, a good solution, but they verified it and came back and bought the software. Okay. So it was a good story. That is a, that is a good story. It shows kind of how you have to prove value by coming up with, I show oh, you, hey, let's try to solve this scenario. Yeah, I am. Um, I know in our conversations, you've been involved in, I think, three different Edelman entries. So there was the one you just mentioned with Caleb yeah. and Continental. I remember that story. And I know uh, there was also the first one was the revenue management story American from Airlines. American Airlines. And what was the third? Third was SNCF. Oh, okay. It was the scheduling. It was, it was the scheduling, scheduling the, uh, with yeah, SNCF. Yeah. That was done the, under the auspices when you were at yeah, ABT? With, yeah. Well, or or Sabre? No, I think I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, that's a little fuzzy, but... But it was, it was uh, when we were doing the revenue management system, we got to know those people. Right. And they got to like us a lot. Uh, and so they said, what about this problem? And so uh, we had never seen that problem before, but we, we, got, we got a good team and, and we did some prototyping and, and came up with something they liked. And so we built it. 
So let's uh, change the subject over yeah. to something uh, where me, we, you and I met was via Informs. Yes. And actually prior to that, I think you were also uh, a president of TIMS, yeah. right? As well as a president of Informs. So what uh, yielded your involvement in initially TIMS and then later Informs? What do you mean? What? Well, in other words, like, what got you involved in society types oh. of work and volunteering, et cetera? Well, mainly, mainly it was business oriented, meaning we needed people. Okay. We needed good people. And that's where good people were. And that's the best way to recruit them was to come to Tim's at the time or Informs or, or Orsa. Right. Uh, to, to find the best and the brightest. In, in the field, and that's that was, and that's kind of why I went around. Oftentimes, the universities and gave gave little seminars uh, at different universities uh, around the country. It's really to, as a recruiting tool. Yeah. I said, okay. When you think about it, uh, we were hiring a lot of OR people. Right. Right. You had a large, large we group. We probably there. had the largest there was. And so. Now, over time, I know you mentioned like, you know, how Sabre grew and yeah. Sabre had what, what, where, as when you were at American Airlines Digital Technologies, the core was OR. And then at Sabre, you know, it started that way and then it got bigger and bigger. Yeah. Now, I mean, I think I've heard like American now has sort of built back their own OR department and doing all that work themselves. A absolutely. Yeah. Right. They, they do it, but it's still, it's, I, I think it's about 25 people. Okay. And uh, then, and then uh, Sabre what, still has OR too. And there's, and so then they're still offering and selling the same types of services that you were doing back then. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, they call it, uh, airline solutions now. Okay. So they've, they've restricted it. They're not taking on the Navy or, or the SNCFs of the yeah, world. Yeah. The right? SNCFs of the world. They decided to just have a narrow focus on the airline business. So um, coming back to the Informs topic, so you and I met when you were president-elect, I think, of Informs, mm -hmm. and you took it upon your time there to say your initiative was going to be about marketing the profession. So I know the story. I'm wearing our Science and Veterans <laughs> shirt <laughs> here, right? Uh, but uh, for the purposes of our audience, right. can you tell the story about what led you to that feeling that that was an important thing to work on? Well, I think it was the important thing to work on because, you know, you go to a cocktail party back then, probably still now, and you and somebody asks, well, what do you do? And you say operations research. They don't know what that is. And you go, you get to the point where, well, it's applying mathematics to real problems. And, uh, and that's about, uh, so I thought that the field was underperforming as far as their impact on business or even, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations or profit organizations. I, I felt like um, there was a real opportunity to do a better job of marketing. We do a great job of talking to ourselves. Uh, still do. <laughs> I still do. But, uh, but not such a great job of uh, promoting uh, the profession as a unique uh, way of uh, improving your business uh, results or well, whatever services you're providing. And, you know, we worked together for a few years on that yeah. program. It, you know, we had right. our heyday and then it kind of tailed off. What do you think would have been needed for it to continue the momentum that we tr tried to establish? Well, I thought part of the, part of the problem is, and you know this too, uh, we had, uh, I was coming from a different orientation than most of the board. Right. Uh, most of the board are academics. And they're, uh, so they didn't have the same, same motivation, uh, that I, that I had. And so I think we were able to get funding to do some things, but, uh, but, uh, I think, I, I don't think there's, uh, I don't know, you have to tell me because you're closer to the board than I am right now, but I don't think it's a high priority these days. 
Well, I think currently informs is a new strategic plan and they talk about promoting the profession. Oh, really? And I think it's now going to come down to a question of investment. Yeah. And we'll see, you know, if the strategic plan was just published this year, okay. earlier in, in 2021. Uh -huh. um, and I think it will be a matter of seeing how they're going to invest in making that happen. It's, right. So given your contributions, both as a business leader in um, and really leveraging OR to deliver business mm -hmm. value, as well as your contributions to to informs and the and mm -hmm. the profession, how would you best like to be remembered? Oh wow, maybe as a leader, yeah. Because I I think uh, I think that seems to be uh, what I'm best at doing. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a hardcore OR researcher. Right. Uh, and I never pretended to be, uh, but I have an appreciation for those kind of guys and women. Uh, so, so maybe as a leader. Uh, and wh where do you see um, OR going as a field, given, you know, the, I'm not, given the words of being used today of, you know, we went to the analytics and now we hear about data science and we yeah. hear about machine learning and AI and all these things. How do you, your, from your point of view, see OR fitting into all of that? Well, you know, at one time, a uh, long time ago, when I was president of maybe Tim's, I'm not sure, um, I gave a speech to, uh, to, the, uh, to the annual meeting. And I was pretty critical of AI at the time, but at the time, AI was expert systems. That's right. And I didn't have much use for expert systems because I always thought that they couldn't do much better than an expert. And I knew that OR can do a lot better than an expert. Right. If it's the right formulation, the right problem. Um, so, uh, so I think when analytics started getting a little bit of traction, uh, publicity, and the idea of advanced analytics being kind of like OR. Mm -hmm. uh, I had I had some uh, hope that that would that would be something that would spur more interest and more interest from you know senior management has to get interested in this stuff. I mean one of the reasons I was successful at American was we had a really good CEO that didn't understand exactly what we were doing, but he appreciated it right. and, and wanted more of it. Uh, so if, if you had more senior management people realizing what value that OR can provide, I think, I think the discipline would, would grow and grow and grow. One of the things that, I found out in my career is a lot of the OR people that we hired and flourished in our group became senior executives in a lot of places. Oh, really? Yeah. One of our guys was CEO of British Airways. Another guy was CEO of Swiss, Swiss Air. Uh, you know, and I could go on. Right. Uh, because OR people, first of all, they're bright. Uh, and second of all, uh, they have a unique way of thinking about problem solving. I think. But I think, but I think maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit here. What's that? <laughs> In the sense that um, you served as a model of somebody who has came from an OR background yeah. and understood how to translate it to the language of business and yeah. sell it, right? So as much as you say Bob Crandall was receptive, yeah, right, you had to deliver the right message. Well, and the guys that work for me had to deliver too. As well. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been receptive. That's right. But but yeah. but you, but you helped them oh, on that sure. journey, sure. which enabled them to then become a CEO of a Swiss Air or yeah, what have yeah, you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think th there's this aspect of you know, as you say, you want to be remembered as a leader. That leadership is about sh how do you communicate? How do you communicate value? Uh -huh. And um, and I think that's something that you know I've seen is that a lot of folks in OR struggle with, right? It is that coming up with the right message to say, 
and you know it's a label right yeah. we've talked about it. it's gonna be or we yeah. have the yeah. or management science right. effort you know we can call right. it analytics data science right. whatever you know ai now has become the umbrella for everything and, right yeah, yeah. yeah and i'm i'm yeah. you know i we can debate that yeah, as right. a, maybe over dinner tonight well, uh, yeah right <laughs> but um but i but but this is the other aspect of it is that the the ability to go out and grow a group like American Airlines yeah. Decision Technologies right. or even larger, you know, you have hundreds of people that are out there selling their services. Yeah. You have you have to learn how to deliver the message. Yeah. And you learned how you, you figured out how to deliver the message. I guess so, yeah. Right? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that that really uh, promoted the growth was we identified people within the group, the OR group, that also had an entrepreneurial kind of spirit. And we gave them almost P&L responsibility to grow their part of the business. Okay. So, so uh, one, one person might be in charge of revenue management, for example. Right. Uh, uh, and he was able to grow, grow that business. One, one, in fact, we even, uh, set up a couple of different uh, almost pseudo companies within AADT uh, when we uh, got into the business of simulating airports and airspaces. We did it at American, so we decided we could do it anywhere. So we did right. it all over the world. I see. Okay. And, but I had a group that did that, and that was their business. I see. You know, and, and by doing that, uh, I think they... They got in. In fact, that business still goes on today with the same people that started it. That's great. Uh, That's great. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm going to conclude there. Okay. Um, I want to thank you for spending the time sure. and telling the, the stories of your career and the growth and the growth of really OR in the airline industry, of which I think you know a lot of people will point to Tom Cook as <laughs> the guy who really made it happen, and and not necessarily by writing the software or right. doing the math, but by leading, as you said. Yeah. And I think uh, that is an incredible value to us as a model of how we can be successful. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you. Okay.